welcome to this talk. It's an intense talk. We have 50 minutes to cover all the subjects. If you have any question, we'll save some minutes at the end so you can have your questions and answer, hopefully. So we will start with what is the science of the initiates? It sounds a bit different, and it is, because we're going to look at things from a different point of view. Many hundreds of years ago, people were so sure that it was a sun that was turning around the planet. And Copernicus came up and said, no, it's the earth that turns around the sun. What people thought, he was crazy. Because the reality of the time is that everybody believed it was the sun that was turning around the planet. So he was imprisoned because nobody wanted to see that reality. Nowadays, we would say, oh, misinformation, conspiracy theory. So what we're going to present now is like another point of view, which is called the heliocentric point of view. What humanity used to hold from that point of view that they thought the sun was turning around the planet is called the geocentric point of view, which is the point of view seen from where we are. Well, initiates and great masters see from the point of view of the spirit or from the sun. So it's the heliocentric point of view. And that reality is different from the reality that is perceived by most people. And why do they see that point of view from where they are? Well, it's because they've worked on themselves. They have come close to the essential truths that are the truths of the spirit. And so by their dedication, by their impersonality, by their um, mission to want to serve humanity, serving the development of humanity, they have been able to attain those moral cosmic laws where the reality is very different from what we see here. So in the old days, in past times, these essential truths were revealed in sacred space, in secret, like in temples. And this happened in Persia, in India, in Egypt, in Tibet. It was the most deserving disciples who had been going through many trials and initiations to be able to access this body of information of essential truths. An example is, for example, in Egypt, people had to be buried for three days in a sarcophagus in order to prove that they had the ability to astral travel. Those who were totally disinterested, who had done their homework, were able to, from their sarcophagus, go astral travel, go and discover the structure of the universe, and they were deserving of the initiations. Some of them did not succeed. They either died in the sarcophagus, or they, they, they scratched the walls until they bled, and they did not pass the initiations. These are the ones that were called like magicians in the sense that they were not Maggies. They were not working for the disinterested, disinterestedness of humanity. They were working for themselves. They had not acquired full self-control. They kind of became magician or demi-master where they knew some great truths, but they were not able to fully practice them on themselves and attain self-control. Nowadays, we no longer need to go into temples and go into these esoteric schools or hidden schools to learn. We are given the chance to learn all these truths from where we are. This is because we're ending Pison Age, and the Pison Age, which lasted 2,160 years, is ending. It was an age where we had did a big shift from eye to eye and tooth to tooth. Now we're, we learn through Jesus, love one another. So you see the progress of humanity is continuing. Tending towards Aquarius 
It's an energy that calls on collectivity, fraternity, integrating our soul and spirit so we become whole. That's what Aquarius is calling us for. And it requires the most advanced, the most prepared, the most um, awakened to bridge the um, Pison age to the Aquarian age. It's a wonderful opportunity that we live at the moment to be those bridges, to allow the energy of Aquarius and this knowledge that was kept secret to be in the open. There has been many, many teachers for humanity. There was Moses, Rama, uh, Krishna, Jesus, um, Pythagoras, Hermes Trismegistus, Steiner, Peter Denov, Omra Mikhail Ivanov is a contemporary master that has been able to deliver this knowledge in present day living. This knowledge has transformed itself with time the essential truths are always there, but according to the development of humanity, this knowledge is being put into poems or into epics or into symbols or parables. Nowadays, it's everyday talking. So, we have in the world of unity, God, and then we have the world of principles, the worlds of laws, and then the diversity and applications of methods here. We will cover some of those as we develop our subject, but um, we're going to go right away into nutrition. Nutrition is something that every one of us need, three times a day for most of us, but we feed our physical body with nutrition. How about learning to feed our soul and our spirit from the very food we take. Food is like a love letter from the Creator. It has stuff written from the planets, from the stars, from the sun, from the moon, from Mother Earth, but we're not used to focus on our food as to decipher the message that it brings. But more importantly is to feed our subtle bodies so here we have a diagram of our constitution. This is our human structure. This is like our physical body is here. It's related to will. We have our astral body, our feelings, our mental body where we have our thinking. This constitutes our lower nature or what Omra Mikhail Ivanov calls our personality. Here we're like on the theater. We play a role, but it's not really us. Us is the person behind, and that's what we are in our divine self. We have our causal body, our higher reason. This is where all the prototypes of every invention exists. Here we have our buddhi body, our soul, and our atmic body, our spirit. So when we eat food to nourish our physical body, most of the time we forget all the rest. And it's the best yoga to practice, the yoga of nutrition, or called Khnani Yoga. In these books, you have all the recipes to nourish your subtle bodies. So what I'm giving you here is like a very quick summary of how the yoga of nutrition can help you develop yourself spiritually and nourish your higher bodies here. So the mouth is the first laboratory where the food enters and the grosser matter goes into the stomach and is being assimilated. The work that we can do with the food in our mouth is that there are some glands on top of the tongue and underneath the tongue that extracts the etheric substance from our food. Therefore, the food that delivers the most of the etheric body is the food the closer to the solar energy, fruits and vegetables. It has the most. And our etheric body is our best protection for our immunity system. If you want to have a strong immune system, build a strong etheric body. And that's by extracting the substance of what we eat through our conscious chewing, our awareness of extracting the particles that have been delivered by all of nature. So, and as we eat, 
if we bring a sense of appreciation, a sense of gratitude for all the elements that are composing, the four elements are there. We have the air, we have the fire through the sun, we have the water, and we have the earth. This is like the angels, the four elements have participated to the making of this food. So it's a matter of concentrating on this food and extracting the elements so that it feeds our etheric body, but feeds, we're using our feelings to enhance that which is connected with the soul. And that way, we not only nourish our body, but we nourish our subtle bodies. And it, by nourishing our subtle bodies, we integrate more of the divinity that we are. We are that. We're just not aware of it. We live at this level, most of us. We talk about this, but how to integrate it when we have a chance three times a day to focus on the quality of our food. It is recommended as the consciousness expands to have uh, a uh, food that affects the least the animals. The animals still have blood and we should protect our little brothers and sisters by not eating them. It's recommended. When the consciousness is ready, it can move up to that level. Of course, the food, as we said, that contains the most solar energy is the one that is the most beneficial for us. And when you eat consciously and you bring your awareness into focus, into the gratitude, the appreciation, all the elements that compose it, that focusing that you do is like the camera. When you focus into something, it creates an opening. In that opening, there's a clear consciousness of things. That's where revelations, intuitions come, is when we appease ourselves into focus, and then that expansion takes place. So when you practice the yoga of nutrition, you have that ability to develop your concentration. It develops your attention as well, so it's a wonderful yoga to practice. Uh, many of you may have um, watched the movie Karate Kid. You remember the teacher was telling Dan uh, all these exercises of painting like this and washing the car like this. And, and the student didn't want to, he wanted to learn the karate to be able to defend himself. And his teacher, no, Dan, you have to learn to focus. And by focusing, when the time comes, you will do the movement I will teach you. So the yoga of nutrition is like that exercise. It is an ability to focus. And that ability will serve you for many, many other activities in your life. So it is a great practice to integrate in your spiritual life. The next subject is love and sexuality. It's another form of nutrition, and we are all affected by our sexuality because we have organs. And these organs were designed by cosmic intelligence, not just for the sake of procreation or pleasure, but for the sake of bringing illumination within the channels that have been prepared within our own subtle bodies in order to connect with the divine. So sexuality is not something to repress. It's not something to reject. It's not something to even neglect. It's something to be very aware of as a sacred part of us that allows us to reach again to our higher self. One way that is recommended is first being aware of those sexual organs and to sublimate the power that these organs hold. And by sublimating what we infer or what Master Omra Mikhail Ivanov infers is to be aware of the potential that exists there and allowing that pressure to rise up like if you were a building on the 10th floor, you need to nourish the people on the 10th floor. You need to have pressure at the base. And that's where there is pressure willing to serve us. We have to invite it to go up by having an ideal here to connect with the Divine Mother, to connect with our masculine principle or feminine principle. 
earlier when I mentioned that the, the world of the initiates is composed of the world of unity, then there are principles and there are laws. Some of these principles is the eternal masculine and the eternal feminine principles. Whatever body you're in, you can bring this energy to connect to your other pole, the pole that is within you. We all have the potential of touching our eternal feminine or masculine to our own self. And this will bring the pressure up to reach up to that level. And if you are with a partner in life, rather than drinking from a bottle that is only eight ounces and then being depleted, you can connect with the eternal source so that there's no depletion. There's not only eight ounces, there is plenty of energy when you connect with the Celestial Father or the Divine Mother through your lovemaking. So it's not a matter of repressing. It's a matter of recognizing what is there and bringing it to a higher dimension. In esoteric science or initiatic science, it is said that men carry the seed and women carry the formative power. That formative power is the magnetism. That's why women form the child within their womb without really having to do anything. Cosmic intelligence gave them that magnetism. So when we talk about sexuality, we can each carry a seed in our mind, like carry the seed of the golden age on earth, and we can each carry the eternal feminine magnetizing, saying, may this magnetism hold this seed and form the golden age. So therefore, every one of us, using our eternal feminine, eternal masculine principles, can contribute to the future of humanity by wishing the golden age as the product of the fusion of these two principles. So it's very profound. There are, uh, these are the two books on love and sexuality by Omra Mikhail Ivanov, summarized into this little book here. And it gives all the secrets, all the methods, all the ways to use that sexuality for the benefit of something more than just pleasure, where pleasure is transformed into a way of working, working with what we are. How are we doing with time? Oh, good. We'll have time for questions and answers. Um, we can come back on this if you have questions later. Our third subject is talking about reincarnation. So we talked about the world of unity, the one. We talked about principles. In the world of principles, there is eternal masculine, eternal feminine which makes the duality, which we know by electricity magnetism, which we know by emissivity receptivity, where we have the acid and the base. But there's also a third principle called trinity, which is the result of the masculine feminine with the child, with the result of electricity magnetism that brings movement, with the acid and base that brings the salt. So you can see from the essential truths, from the point of view from there, that everything is held on all levels. You have from the spiritual level, down through Mother Nature, and then down to manifestations. So beyond the principles, we have the laws. And there are more laws than principles. Then comes the world of manifestation, the world of diversity, where all things created are manifested. Now we will cover some of the laws, such as the law of karma. Karma was known before as cause and effect. It's only in modern uh, days that we've called it a way to pay for our misdeeds, which sometimes uh, is kind of hard to face. But when we look at it as cause and effect, it's something that exists like in the universe. We cannot change it. Cosmic intelligence has given every seed, every insect, every animal the possibility to reproduce a 
uh, on its own um, element. It produces of its own kind. So for us, that cause and effect becomes the law of reincarnation. What we've created, we can decreate. But stretch in time, because in one lifetime, it's very short to create and decreate. Cosmic intelligence, again, has given us a lot of time so that in between we can learn, improve, so that the reaction is not so big at the end because we get to improve along the way. So to understand reincarnation is like the foundation of this cosmic moral law that there is a reaction for every action we create. Within the law of reincarnation, there's the law of necessity, the law of freedom, and the law of providence, which means that those who are totally unaware, they just go about their daily living, eating, sleeping, creating children, without realizing that they are a divine being, they operate under the law of necessity. That means there's no correction. It's like fatality. Whatever they created, they will get. It's like the law comes back to you, like the law of echo. It comes back to you what you've created. The next sub-law of that law of reincarnation is the law of freedom, where through your loving kindness, through your generosity, through your disinterestedness, you give of yourself something that neutralizes some of the karma you've done. You've entered the law of freedom by doing some good deeds. Some of your karma is, is erased. Instead of having a big accident, you might have a little scratch. And the third law is the law of providence within that concept. And the law of providence, it's the great masters, the initiates, where they don't owe anything to start with. They come as a sacrifice to help mankind evolve to do the will of God and allow the planet to go into its cycle of evolution. And they operate under grace. So that's very few of us are at that level, of course. So you can see that within reincarnation, there are some abilities that you can choose through your own freedom to ease the karma, depending on your devotion or abnegations and so forth. Also, in the system of laws, there's the law of affinity. And we know that by a bird of the same feather flock together, which means that we attract that which we emanate. It's a natural phenomenon again. It's one of those cosmic moral laws. There's a book here for cosmic moral laws and reincarnation being explained very well in here. And through the law of affinity, not only do you attract that which resembles you, but that which you nurture in your soul. If you have, for example, a high ideal, a high ideal is something that you often think of that pulls you up. It could be becoming the divinity that you are. It could be the kingdom of God on earth or the golden age if you prefer something more modern. But the, the um, high ideal is like what pulls you in, in, and drives your energies towards a direction. So in the law of affinity, when you work with a high ideal, you call on the help of all the energy that is related to that high ideal. All the higher entities are there to come and help you and protect you and guide you. So that's a, a wonderful law to be aware of. The other law is the law of exchange. Without exchanges, we don't have the motivation to move forward. So the law of exchange is you buy something at the grocery and you pay for it. The law of exchange is between people. You learn from each other. The auras come closer. There is qualities and virtues that are shared in the auras. So the law of exchange is there to help us to help us make those exchanges and recognize that it is an opportunity to evolve, to learn, to grow. Um, within also the, the, the system of laws, um, 
Ah, oh, there was one more. Mm, I think it might come back later. Okay, so the reincarnation is the one system that if we accept it, helps us to prepare our next lifetime. We cannot change the past because that's already done. The only way we can change the past is by entering into the law of freedom. And that's in the moment. In the moment, we can do that. But for the future, our biggest tool is to prepare ourselves by consciously developing ourselves. That will give us the best guarantee for our future. So it's quite a benefit to be aware how many of you here believe in reincarnation? Oh, easy. Most everybody. <laughs> Wonderful. It makes it easier. So we've covered in a very fast way these three subjects. It's kind of the essence. Um, the key to solve the problem of existence is another book here that really explains well our lower nature which should be at the service of our higher nature. This is a system that includes astrology, that includes our structure, and that really helps us to understand where we're at and where is our energy floating, is our energy stuck on the mental level, trying to analyze everything. We become cold when we stay at that level. If we operate strictly from the emotional level, then we may not have the discernment that is necessary to extricate ourselves from, from emotional complications. We need a little bit more light into the feelings. So it's important to balance. This is like our trinity when we talked about the world of unity, duality, and the world of trinity, the principles. This is our own trinity. When we have proper light in our mind and proper feelings, we stand in truth. We form an equilateral triangle. So far, all the philosophies that have been brought on the planet was in order to develop ourselves towards the divine. So all the systems were to bring people in, in, into being one with God, which was the right motivation. But it hasn't changed very much for here on the planet. Now what is required of us is that we reverse this triangle and bring it down, which means bring spirit into matter. We need to transform this planet to make it a garden of paradise. And it's not going to happen with the hermits in the grottos or with the monks and with the nuns. And They've wanted to reach nirvana. They wanted to be one with God. And it's part of wanting, desiring something. But what is required of us for the Aquarian age is all of us need to be involved to change what is happening on the planet. And that's bringing spirit into matter. Spirit is already perfect in its realm. We have to prepare our bodies. We have to prepare our astral body, our mental body, make room so that this comes down, so that everything we will touch and impregnate will have the seal of spirit. And that means being active in our mind, in the sense of, if you wash the windows, as I wash the window, I wash my soul of all its impurities. If you pull weeds in the garden. As I pull weeds, I pull all the negative stuff in me. And bringing spirit into everything you do. And that's how you revive. You revive the soil. You leave imprints in the windows, on the dishes. And that's how you vivify matter through the activation of your own mind, your own spirit. This is our duty at the moment. Aquarius is requiring us to do a quantum leap bringing the energy that is, if we're not quite there into Aquarius yet, but we're like in the springtime. It may say the 21st of March, but in February you get really nice spring weather, or in April you have a snowstorm. So spring is not 21st of March, like Aquarius is not arriving on a specific day. We already are into the influence of Aquarius, and we're trailing with the 
Python age. We have about another 20 years until we fully integrate the energies of Aquarius. But we sense it, we feel it, the need to change. All the electronic developments that is happening is all an influence of Aquarius. But Aquarius, what it asks of us is to bring this higher nature into who we are here so we become whole. That's our duty. And as we become whole and contact each other through exchanges, others are invited sometimes without a word. Just because we carry this in our aura, it influences where we go, what we touch. So it, it's a beautiful program. I remember somebody having asked Edgar Casey back in the 1940s, why are there so many people on the planet? And he said, because it's an incredible opportunity to come now because the changes is in fi uh, fast mode. And honestly, going between the Pisces age to the Aquarius is like going from 110 volt to 550 volt. So it's like it needs an awakening. It needs, we are into a process of acceleration. It's an incredible opportunity that we have to be incarnated at the moment. So how are we going to invite spirit to come through us? By having methods of work, by being inspired, by creating activities that sustain spirit, and that there's many, many methods and in these books here, in the, the ones we have at our booth, 110, there are many, many methods where you can integrate spirit into matter. Any questions so far? I'm curious where you got the figure 20 years until um, Aquarius. Is that the question? The question is, how do I know that Aquarius will be completely here in 20 years? Where did I dig that 20 years? It's an approximation. I heard it would be like around year 2050, around that area that we will be fully into Aquarius. It's an approximation. Yes? Can you talk about the technology part of Aquarius? How is that benefiting the bringing the spirit world down? So the question is um, Aquarius and the age of technology, how can it bring the energy of spirit down? Well, Aquarius is a very, uh, has a very refined system. We've seen this with the internet in the past 20 years. We see it with AI coming up. It's a very, very refined system, very advanced system. If it's at the service of science as we know materialistic science, it could be very dangerous. It's always how you use it. It is there, maybe we could develop telepathy. Maybe we can even develop ourselves to be able to be in bilocations. It, 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 it holds tremendous energy. I, you remember earlier when we said about the geocentric point of view and the heliocentric point of view? Science so far has taken the path of being geocentric, materialistic science, because it needs to verify, it has to be seen, it has to be weighed, calculated. It doesn't take any of the subtle elements into consideration. So in the age of Aquarius, all this is supposed to come down and to serve a higher purpose. But there are still some consciousness that are stuck on the materialistic level. At, on the geocentric point of view. And therefore, they cannot capture the finer reason to use something. Like a candle, you can use it to meditate or burn down the house. It's the same with this technology. It is very refined technology. It, it's one reason why we should pay attention to eating very fine food, very good food, so that we vibrate at a higher frequency and capture these fine elements. The more spiritual we are, the more they will serve our high ideal, our purpose. But these energies are there of Aquarius. Those who are very materialistic could use them for other purposes that will burn the house down. So it's, it's there, it depends on the consciousness. 
the battle that is happening now is between uh, matter and spirit. It's a great battle. We have, in, in Hindu, they call it the Kali Yug. We could not fall any lower than we are at present with humanity. We are so down, embedded in matter that we forgot spirit even exists. I don't talk about you here, of course. <laughs> I talk about the world in general. And Kali Yuga is the age of iron. It's the age of materialization. It's also the compression that we feel because we're not satisfied. We thought all these means would bring us happiness, would bring us illumination. It hasn't. It's compressing us more and more into systems that will be meant to disappear. They don't serve spirit. It was supposed to bring us more freedom so that we connect more with spirit. So we're at the bottom of the barrel and now we have only one way up to go. So in, in the Aquarian team that I, I write with other authors, um, we have in our first book a chapter called Involution and Evolution. We are in the cycle of involution, descending into matter. We've descended, descended, and we can't go any lower. So now we have to take the path back. Taking the path back means that we recognize we are soul and spirit. We're having a bodily experience, but primarily we are soul and spirit. So from now on, humanity has to take that course or it will eliminate itself. And like it's not the first time humanity would disappear, we've gone through five humanities so far. So, but there's always a part that survives to ensure the next one to keep evolving. The point is to make this planet a beautiful place and people come and go in different habits in different countries. So the opportunity to be aware of what is coming is wonderful because we can get into that speed of evolution with spirit. Yes? Yeah, so you mentioned um, an upright triangle and then sort of how we've been looking up to God and then um, an inverted triangle and how we're trying to bring spirit into matter. Um, can you talk about how some of our current methods are going to change as a result of that transition? So this gentleman is, to, is mentioning the fact that I talked about humanity taking the path upward of the triangle and how with bringing the triangle down here, what are the methods that will affect us in the future? The method of the past to, to seek nirvana in samadhi and being one with God was fine. Those who were able to have that thirst experienced that. It was wonderful. It hasn't brought the golden age on earth. But now what is asked is that the quantity get at it because we need the quantity in order to bring the golden age on earth. By reverting the triangle means we're not going to despise earth. We're not going to neglect our body like has been done in the past. We're going to honor them. And that knowledge, which all these methods contain, is that every day we have an opportunity through whatever we think, we feel, we act to bring a higher energy in our life. So we need methods because all these, the world of uh, principles and laws, they need application. It, it needs to, to have effects on matter in our actions. We need tools and these tools are methods. The methods that Omra Mikhaila Ivanov has brought were, in, as we mentioned, in old days, in temples, in, in um, uh, secret esoteric schools, were divulged to the students. But now they're out in the open. Initiations in our everyday life. We don't have to go to hidden schools and temples. It's the methods and the ways to solve problems as we come across them. All the technologies that exist should be serving our divine purpose and not using them for expanding our wealth or for expanding our political views. In theories, people work for three things, for power, for prestige, 
or for money. That's not what our divine self needs. Not at all. This is the human, the lower part that looks for those things. We should be open, receptive, and welcoming what this holds here so that we can apply it here. So it's like we're moving from the geocentric point of view to the heliocentric point of view and integrating this in our daily life. In fact, we don't have to move countries. We don't have to separate from our partners. We can do all this work right where we stand in our very life. It's a matter of consciousness, awareness of consciousness. And yes, maybe changes with our nutrition, some of the activities that may not be conducive to our higher self. Yes, we may have to change a few habits. But in theory, we should be living like human beings in society. We don't have to go to grottos and monasteries anymore. We can apply this in our life. One more question. Yeah, I'd like to get back to like, um, your chart. The lower nature is a gift, and hopefully it will serve so to bring to draw the higher nature down. How do we resist those forces outside of us or within us that keep us from wanting to join lower nature with higher nature. Here, it, it's a gift, but it's also what we created. Our lower nature, we build that over time from atavic forces, from our development to where we are today. So it holds a lot of potential. It, it's great forces. We should not deny that, nor should we deny sexual forces. It's to create an awareness that this is incomplete. It will never reach happiness from here. Everything will be ever temporarily by staying at this level. It's to create the connection, the connection with our higher self. There we will taste happiness. There we will taste illumination. So it's fusing those two, not rejecting it, fusing them together. And that's by every little effort we make to make our life pure, more subtle, more aware of the divine world there. It is there. It's just that we're not aware of it. It's like our aura. We all have it, except we don't see it and we don't pay much attention to it. But it's there. This is there too. It's just so much more subtle that it's not being seen by us. But there are saints and there are prophets and masters whose aura covered kilometers because they had integrated their higher self into them. Our higher self is like in the sun at the moment. It's far from us. And the sun is, in theory, the best representation of our own trinity. The sun, through its light, through its warmth, through its life, it gives us the wisdom, the love, and the life, which is fantastic. Did you know that every civilization that experienced a golden age on Earth was always based on a solar civilization? Always. So we have a little book, um, The Splendor of Tiferet, here. Tiferet is the name of the sun, according to the Kabbalah. So the sun is the best representation of our divinity, of our trinity. And that's the heliocentric point of view in the tree of life. So um, it will come to a conclusion. We've covered our time, but I, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, just a quick comment is that in our evolution uh, conscious, we think a lot about our food and nourishing ourselves, but we don't think about, so we think about what we put in our mouths, but not what we put into our minds. And I think it's important that you maybe take less time watching the news, as the science of happiness demonstrates people who don't watch the news are just generally happier. And even like watching a movie that's, you know, that's very negative or something, also that attaches to us yes. on a subconscious level. So, you know, just try to surround yourself with happy people and, and watch things that, that elevate you.
Yes. In the question, and I'm repeating just for the recording, is we think of nourishing our physical body. But what do we put in our mind? What do we watch? What do we listen to? And in the tree of life, there is a sefirot called um, Yezod. And Yezod is purity. And purity is like right above planet Earth. It's purity. And then the sun is there. And then there's the pillar of rigor and clemency. Purity should operate at all levels. Purity of thoughts, purity of food, purity of what we drink, purity of what we listen to, purity of what we watch. It, it is a good opportunity to feed ourselves on all level, putting purity as a criteria of allowing the higher self to come down, practicing purity on all levels. We have separated spirit and matter because we are divided ourselves. We don't carry the full awareness of our divine self, so therefore we live at the point of matter. But every night, you're right, we separate from our body and we go somewhere. We go astral traveling. This is how the body repairs itself uh, from a uh, biological point of view. But the soul goes somewhere. One of the methods given by this teaching is to go to divine school at night, to consciously choose to go to a school where you can learn to serve better, where you can go and help others. When there's a disaster somewhere, I know my husband and I, we say, we tonight choose to go and help these people through our astral travel. They need help. We're going to go and help them. So this is something where you relate spirit and matter, bring them to work together. We all do travel at night anyway. Might as well go somewhere you can help or learn. Divine school, go and learn something in divine school. <laughs> yes, that's a way of relating spirit and matter. Um, I'm going to come to a very quick end. I would like to tell you a little something about my teacher, the teaching that I've been practicing for over 40 years. Uh, the teaching of Omra Mikhail Ivanov. Um, he was born in Bulgaria. He delivered his teaching mostly in France from 1937. He was sent by Master Peter Denov, knowing that communism was coming to Bulgaria. He said, go to France, bring my methods, adapt them to the Western world. When Omra Mikhail Ivanov traveled to India, first in 1959, he met with Guru Swamiji's and the great Babaji. It is on this trip that he was given the honorific title Omram by three mysterious beings, Omram, which means Salve and Coagula. When he went back in 1982, he met another great sage, Madrasi Baba, who said he had seen him 15 years before coming from the sun. He told Omram he didn't know which country he came from, but he knew that it was not India and that he carried the sign of a Brahma Rishi on his forehead and that he had all the knowledge of Vyasa within him. So anyway, that's just a little story and sharing. Thank you for coming and happy living. Thank you.